Hello and welcome to another episode of Fire Dev, a fireside chat with developers. So today I have with me Jesse Anglin, who is the CEO and co-founder, or founder, I'll ask that in a second, of Rapid Innovation. And it's a blockchain startup, but instead of me trying to explain what he does, what Rapid Innovation is, I'll hand it over to him to introduce himself. Hey man, thanks for having me on the podcast. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'm Jesse Anglin. I am the uh, one of three co-founders, actually, of Rapid Innovation. Myself and uh, two of my business partners started this company about three and a half years ago now. Um, and uh, so the the idea of Rapid Innovation was very very simple. Um, I saw a need in the market for very focused blockchain development um, or a company focused on blockchain development, really web three development is the end, the end goal of what I want to get into, which I think covers more than blockchain. Um, but we decided to start with blockchain. And so um, we just wanted to build a dev agency from the ground up built on, on the foundation of, uh, of blockchain development. And so everybody that we've got on board from our designers to you know, our front end guys, our back end guys, they're all, uh, all of their experience is rooted in, uh, in blockchain and in web three. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's the, the quick and dirty intro. Okay. And how big is rapid innovation? Cause it's, it's not that old. The company isn't, uh, I mean, blockchain technology in reality isn't that old in itself. So it can't be that old, but yeah. how big is rapid innovation and what sort of clients and customers do you have yeah so um <clears throat> size wise uh we're we're sitting at about 300 people on the team right now um we've we have grown relatively quickly and i think that's mostly just because there's there's a lot of people that want to get into the space and want some structure around being in the space instead of just freelancing or or joining a team um and so i think the vision for where we're going uh, has it has attracted a, a lot of people um what was the next question uh to, 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 yeah that was it just basically how big oh. it is okay yeah. and in terms of somebody looking to use you know rapid innovation use their services who would be like an ideal you know client to person like who would be you know suited to benefit from what you know you guys are offering and who would be the person that would you know you would say you probably don't need our services yet yeah so our main focus for the last so for the first two years i would say was strictly mvp development and so i mean mostly because blockchain technology was new enough there wasn't really a lot of existing clients a lot, there was a lot of experimentation and r d going on people trying to build new stuff and so it was that early stage entrepreneur who had raised a little bit of money for an idea and we would come in and we would build out their minimum viable product um or potentially their poc um or their you know their proof of concept um although we've been shifting lately to a little bit more sophisticated uh clients and so we still handle that early stage startup like the the entrepreneur and i would say that that's that is probably 80% of our business. And then 20% is the mid, uh, mid size to large enterprise and kind of the serial entrepreneur. So people who've already started successful companies, um, they've got a significant amount of funding and they're looking to build something a little bit, uh, bigger, uh, you know, a little bit more sophisticated. So those, I would say that that's kind of our breakdown of ideal client. Okay. And what does the company look like in terms of a split? Like how many, cause he said there's about 300 people like, you know, developers, designers, HR, like what would you say has the most focus and like, what's the sort of split in, you know, company like blo uh, blockchain company, like your, like rapid innovation and at that size? Yeah. Good question. Um, so we're we're very very dev heavy because that's the mm -hmm. majority of like the heavy lifting we do um and so we usually sit between like 100, 190 and 220 developers probably some somewhere in there okay um, that's, a fair bit. No, and, that's a big chunk 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's a, that's a pretty big chunk of what we do. One of the things just because of the niche we've fallen into with the discovery side of things is that clients will come to us with a high level idea. You know, I want to build X, but it doesn't have a lot of the detail mm -hmm. um, in like their, their vision, right? Because these are entrepreneurs, like they think big. And so I've got a team of people. Um, I call my discovery design architecting team that their entire job is to be experts in the Web3 space and then become experts in whatever your idea is. And so they spend all day, every day working with clients to help pull the details of what it is they want to build out of their heads, get it on paper in a format that developers can actually use to build something. Um, because people don't, typically think about the details of, of everything that needs to go into building, you know, to, to actually developing a functional product that user end users can actually use. Um, and so that's another big chunk, uh, you know, let's say maybe 30, 30 people, 25 people, 30 people on there. So business, business analysts and uh, tokenomics experts and UI UX guys and, um, and a technical team that can take, like user requirements and turn them into technical requirements and understand what the most scalable, efficient tech stack is going to be. And kind of the the architects, right? If you, you want to go build a house, you need a team of architects that are going to say, this is actually what the house looks like. And this is what we need to build in order to meet, you know, the end user's needs and actually, you know, fulfill what you want to fulfill. So that's a big chunk. Um, and then on the other end of the process, I've got a big chunk of people that are doing like uh, the quality assurance stuff. So I've got a QA team, um, the DevOps uh, to help actually get everything launched uh, in a way that doesn't cause problems. Because in the blockchain space, there's some, you know, like when you push a contract out on, say, Ethereum, it's immutable. You don't go back and you don't change, you know, you don't get to change it. And so the like typical web two DevOps is pretty simple. Like, you know, you get your servers spun up and, and you push your code and if things need to change, you go and you modify stuff. But that is not the case when it comes to blockchain development, uh, at least around specific chains. There are some where there's mutable code, but um, a lot of what we work on is immutable. And so that's a pretty sophisticated team there just to make sure that the launch goes well, because that's a, a pretty or can be a pretty tricky spot. And then my my DevSecOps uh, and auditing team, um, because one of the things I'd like to be known for is, you know, there's especially in the blockchain space, there's a lot of hacks and there's a lot of just bad things that happen that that take companies out that could have been avoided if someone had just taken the time to actually do a really good audit. And so I've got a separate department completely separated from the uh, development team that goes through and actually audits everything that we push out so that we can maintain our reputation of secure code and, and no hacks and, you know, things actually working out like they're supposed to. Um, and then I've got a, I've got a small marketing team and I've got a small sales team and that kind of make, Oh, and then I've, I've got a small HR team. I think there's, uh, is, well, it's actually pretty big for the size of our company. There's eight people on the HR team, but a lot of them are really just recruiting. Okay. Because especially early on, it was very, very difficult to find people in the Web3 space um, that like they're just it not, not because people weren't interested, but because there just weren't a lot of them, you know, three and a half years ago. And so um, HR is also in charge of headhunting and recruiting. Um, instead of outsourcing that, I just kind of built that team in-house. Okay, so you basically have, I'm guessing, internal recruiters that double up as of now due to the size of the company as your HR department as well. Is that what you would exactly. say? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I think it's pretty accurate. Okay, and were those guys, you know, initially recruiters that you brought in and or were they HR? Like, what were they? Because that's obviously, that's quite interesting because they're doing recruiting jobs and job, but they're also doing the HR side of the company because, yeah, the company's not Google, but it's not a two-person company either. There's still, you know, certain legal stuff, certain processes that need to be in place with a 300-person company. So what were they before they, you know, joined? They were HR. And then the okay. recruiting side of things, I, I figured we could train the recruitment. I mean, recruiting is just a lot of activity, right? It's knocking on doors and asking people if they want to come work for you. And so 
you know, the, the recruiting side, I figured I could train the HR side. I, I didn't really want to train. And so I started with a foundation of HR and then Mm -hmm. kind of built the recruiting piece on top of that. Okay. And what's your background? Like, what was you doing before, you know, you had the idea with, you know, your co-founders for rapid innovation, like what's your technical background? How far back? Oh, technical background. That's a specific question and an interesting story. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll start there. So, uh, so prior to learning about the blockchain space, I was actually in the real estate sector. Um, and, uh, it was actually one of my clients that introduced me to blockchain when he decided to sell his entire portfolio of real estate and buy Bitcoin back in 2012. Um, pretty early on. (laughs) Yes. Early, early enough that he made some good money. Um, and uh, and I, I tried to talk him out of it because I thought he was selling the world's best investment and buying this you know digital scam thing. Uh, yeah. I was wrong. He was right. And for the next two years, two and a half years, he tried to recruit me into his company that he was building around uh, blockchain development. Now, back then, you didn't have Ethereum. Uh, and so blockchain development looked very different. It was basically like a web two platform that used Bitcoin as the payment system. And I had a, I had a pretty big problem with that because it felt like if you're talking about the, the value proposition of blockchain being like censorship resistant, immutable, all all this other stuff, if you go and you build that on a web two foundation, it's no longer has like none of the value proposition even makes any sense Uh anymore. And so I wasn't really interested in getting into the space. Uh, But then he introduced me to Vitalik in uh, 2014. And I realized that that was the solution to all of the problems that I had with the blockchain space, because now you could actually have your entire backend and with things like IPFS and other, other, you know, basically other things that people were talking about doing you could create this entire ecosystem <clears throat> where where the app even the front end if you really wanted to the the entire application could be built on a blockchain and things like you know unstoppable domains and and stuff like that and so i i got the vision at that point i fell in love and uh and so this friend of mine wanted me to come in and build and train a web3 a development team mhm Um, and so you'd think that he would be asking me to do that because I had a very technical background, but the truth is I had almost no technical background. I mean, in high school, I'd written a couple of like HTML web pages with some really terrible CSS. Uh, you know, I had cheated at some video games, written a few like bots in Python and like, I, I just, I had very, very little technical training. I was all self-taught and, uh, the first serious development I actually did in my life was writing a uh, a smart contract on Ethereum, uh, and uh, and so he he wanted me to come in and do it. I told him I thought it was a terrible idea because I you know he could find someone a lot more technical, um, but he said that I was passionate enough it wouldn't really matter and I had access to the internet so who cares. And so I just, I, I rolled with it. And I would say today, I understand blockchain better than most people uh, from, from the how it works standpoint. Um, but I am still a pretty terrible, like, developer. Like, you wouldn't, I've got, I've got guys who are really, really good. Like, you would not want, you would not want to hire me to go and write you smart contracts. Um now, maybe like architecting an entire system, like I've done so much of that at this point that uh, that I would say I'm I'm pretty proficient there. But when it comes to actually sitting down and writing code, I'm I'm not the guy for you. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how I started my technical journey. Really, I cut my teeth in tech uh, with blockchain, and so almost all of my experience is built on on that foundation. Okay, and like, how did you get into property? So, yeah, so you go back even further. So my my dad was a construction worker. He built houses. He was a carpenter. And uh, I was homeschooled back before homeschooling was cool uh, for the last two years, at least. And uh, I 
a friend of mine dropped out of school and I thought, what a fascinating concept. Like you can just quit doing school. This is amazing. <laughs> And, uh, and so I told my mom when I was, I was 13 and a half, I told my mom, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to do school anymore. And my mom being the, the brilliant woman that she is said, oh, that's fine. Uh, yeah, you can drop out. I just need you to finish 12th. Like I need you to finish seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th and 12th grade and get passing grades. You can be done whenever you want. And I was like, oh, I didn't know any better. I didn't realize that that's not what dropping out of school actually was. Yeah. And so between like 13 and a half and 14 and a half, I finished all of those grades. I just worked really hard, got them done, passed, and I uh, figured I could sit around and be lazy until I was 18 and my parents kicked me out of the house. Uh, and my dad told me that I needed, if I was going to not be in school, I needed to, uh, I needed to get a job. And so I got into construction and, uh, and started working with a general contractor to build houses and did that for a long time. Um, and so at some point, probably when I was about 22 years old, I realized that building houses is a game for other people. Like I'm not, you know, I, I just, I, I enjoyed like the physical aspect of it. You know, I enjoy being in shape and I enjoy working out and like, I enjoyed that aspect of it, but it was just hard and miserable and I, I didn't like the culture and, I didn't, I didn't necessarily love the people that I was working with. Uh, and so I decided, well, if I'm not going to build houses, I might as well start selling houses. And, uh, and so I went and got my real estate license, uh, joined a, joined a company, um, having never had an office job in my life. I didn't even know the difference between a copy machine and a fax machine. Uh, and, um, in the, I joined in June. It was June 9th, 2009. Uh, and by the end of that year, I was their third highest producer. And I thought, gosh, this is super easy. Like all you have to do to like be successful is just call people. Like this is like the easiest job I've ever had. And, uh, you know, I could sit in an air conditioned office while everyone else was, you know, dying outside. And I could sit in a heated office when everyone else was freezing to death. And, it was just amazing. And so I did that for a while. And that's how I met uh, Zach, who was the guy who eventually got me into blockchain space. Okay. And like, because you just mentioned that, you know, you did really well at the sales and that like, from your perspective, you were thinking that, uh, you know, it's easy because I can just sit in an air conditioned office and just, you know, make phone calls. Do you think you was partly good or driven to be successful in that you know industry in you know selling retail in, you know, i mean in, in selling real estate because you had seen a more harder you know work life you know being outside in the cold or in the heat and being tired and after you know experiencing that the other part seemed easy and you was more motivated yeah i mean i think i i think that had a lot to do with it I mean, I never understood. I remember, I remember the first month of being in that real estate office. I would, like, you know, I was, I was in an office I shared with another guy who was also very motivated. Um, but like in the other offices around me, there was all these people that were doing nothing. And then we'd have our like monthly sales meeting, and they would talk about, you know, how the markets were bad because this was two thousand nine, right? That we had just suffered like one of the largest housing crashes globally. That you know, in in the past. 70 years and like the economy was terrible and everyone was talk sitting there blaming the economy and how bad it was and life is terrible and all this stuff. And I thought, man, you don't make any phone calls. Like you don't talk to anybody. What do you mean? Life is terrible. Like life's not terrible. I'm making more money right now than I've ever made in my entire life. I'm working like so much less than I ever have. Like this isn't terrible. Like it's pretty freaking easy to just dial a phone number and have mm -hmm. a conversation with someone. It's not like the conversation is difficult. You just ask them, you know, do you own a home? And they say, no. They say, do you want to? And they say, no. And you say, thank you. And you move on to the next person. Like, it's not hard. You know, it was just, it was so easy. I didn't understand why other people weren't like doing it and yeah. they couldn't figure it out. Um, and so part of it was like, I think part of it was that like, I was used to like physically working hard and the job was just physically easier. Mm -hmm. But the other part of it was that I didn't, I think I, it kind of carried over from that same mentality of like getting school done. 
like, you know, when my mom told me I could drop out of school if I finished all of the grades I had left, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's an easy task, right? I just have to go finish it. And so I did. Um, and maybe it's that I didn't know any better. You know, I didn't, I didn't know to think that it was difficult to do that. Um, yeah. like looking back on it, a lot of people are like, wow, that's, that sounds like it would have been really hard. But as a kid, I did it. And I, when I went through all of my schooling, it wasn't hard. It was just work. Like I just, all I had to do is learn the stuff and pass the tests. It's not like it was rocket science. You had and a goal. as long as I, yeah, as long as I knew the information, I could pass the test and then I could move on to the next grade. Mm -hmm. And so I could get, you know, I could get a grade done every 45 or 50 days. Um, and the, I, I kind of felt the same way. And like, if I didn't have any leads that I was currently working with in the real estate market, it was like, well, my work today is to go get leads and, and to go talk to people until I find someone who says yes. And so I'll call, you know, I'd call a hundred people a day and I just, you know, I'd call them out of the phone book or I'd go walk around the mall and just ask people, do you own a home? I mean, it felt super, super simple to me. And eventually, if you talk to enough people, someone would say, no, I don't own a home. And then someone would say, yes, I want to. And you'd say, awesome, I can help you do that. And then you'd show them houses and then they would buy one and then you'd get paid. It just seemed super easy to me. Yeah, I mean, it's like a lot of things in life that I've experienced as well. You, clearly, you've experienced it as well. It's just the act of trying. Most people don't even, you know, try. So they they don't know if they can succeed or they don't try long enough. It's like that old yep. saying or like I remember seeing an image online about, you know, people you know, digging a, a, you know, a hole for oil and they dig like four miles down and if they had just dug a little bit longer, like another mile, they would have hit oil. But it would, they, yep. they, they just kept digging shallow, you know, holes, uh, you know, expecting to get oil. Yep. Dude, I think that's like a lot of life that mm. I've discovered is that, you know, for me, whenever I fail at something, you know, like uh, when I first started Rapid Innovation, I needed people who were building in the blockchain space, right? Like you have to have clients. It's pretty hard to run a development company with no clients. And so I started reaching out to people and everyone told me no. Um, and and my, my first like lead generation effort, I would say was a complete failure. Like I just didn't find anybody, but I'd never, I don't, I've just never been able to see those things as failures. I've just always seen them as like, well, I learned a way I shouldn't be doing this. Like how I'm doing, it's not working. I should try something else. And then I try something else. And as soon as I find something that works, I sit down and I analyze like, why did this work? And once I understand why it worked, then I, then I can duplicate it and make it efficient and double down on it and then hire someone to do that thing for me and then go find something else that works. And like this entire company has been built on that one principle of find things that work and then make them efficient and then hire people to do them and then find the next thing that works. And I don't know. I think the formula for success is, is simple. Like there's, there's, I, I'm an avid, avid reader. Uh, I love to read. Um, I'm like a 45 to 55 books a year kind of guy. <laughs> and if you read books about entrepreneurialism and starting businesses, you'll find that if you read a hundred of them, you'll find they all say the same thing in a, in a bunch of, in a hundred different ways. Um, and it usually boils down to like, you're going to have to work. <laughs> You know, like, and that's it. Like, you're gonna have to work. And if something doesn't work, you're gonna have to try something else and find something that does work. And when you do find something that does work, you need to become efficient and you need, and maybe it's not quite that simple, but I think in, in my mind, if I keep it that simple, I find there's plenty of other complications that come up along the way that need to get dealt with. And so if you keep the core principle the same, you know, you need to work at it then everything else kind of gets gets easier. It's not any different than someone who wants to go learn to run, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, oh, I can't, I couldn't run 10 miles. Well, yeah, you probably can't run 10 miles, but I can guarantee you that if you run as far as you can today, and then tomorrow you run as far as you can, and the next day you run as far as you can, 
and you don't see your lack of being able to run 10 miles as a failure. And instead, you just realize that the activity that you can put into it today is what success is made out of. Then eventually you, you won't run 10 miles, you'll run 30 or you'll run 50. Like you can become a runner and it's just by putting in activity. I, I feel like most of life is that way. And all of my success is attributed to that one foundational principle that I live my life by. Yeah. I I mean, it's like when you was building houses, if you, you know, got too bogged down by the detail of, okay, I've got to build this building, this, let's say big building. And, you know, you could feel overwhelmed, but if you think, you know what, I've just got to, first of all, build this wall. And before I build the wall, I've got to lay the foundation, then just lay one brick at a time, one row at a time. And before, you, and if you just have those smaller goals, you know, they're getting there. As long as, you know, you orient the goals, I'd say, in a direction that gets you to, you know, your path, you know, you'll yeah. get there. It's like if I want to walk from here to some location and it's one mile away, as long as I'm taking each step that goes towards that direction roughly, you know, I will get there. But if I say, oh, you know, that's one mile away, I'm tired or it's difficult or I've never walked a mile or I'm not a walker or, you know, whatever, you know, million excuses that you can find, then you'll never do it. But it's that act of starting. That's one thing because I'm a big reader as well and I, you know, read a lot of entrepreneur books and, you know, just biopics, I mean, biographies. And that's like the common thing that you see is that, yeah. They were willing to start when their friends and family either, you know, put their idea down or wasn't willing to start themselves. Yeah, did that was real estate. It was funny because I decided to get into real estate. It was it was like January two thousand nine, and we just had the giant housing crash, mm-hmm. and the economy is is in the tanks. And I can't do the number. No one encouraged me. Nobody except for my wife. Uh, a hundred percent of the people that I talked to said that I was an idiot because I had two little kids. I was getting into an industry. I had no idea what I was doing because I was a construction worker and I can't be a, you know, white collar guy. Um, and I'm getting in at the worst time humanly possible to get into real estate. Um, and they all said, don't start. And I think that, that, that is the mentality of most people Mm -hmm. is that, like you shouldn't start something that you might fail at. And I think one of the, and th- this gets me into trouble a little bit, but one of the, I, I just don't, I don't believe that failure has to be the end all be all in life. Like for some reason we've created like this idea as, as a, you know, as, as humanity that if we fail, that's bad. Mm-hmm. I've never felt like that. Like I failed at more things in my life than, like tons of people that I know, like I'm, I'm constantly failing. Uh, and failure to me is good because you learn so much more from things that don't work than you learn from things that do work. And it's the only way to get to things that do work. But it seems like people have this expectation that if they try something, it doesn't work out, then they should quit or maybe they shouldn't have tried it at all. And so the next time they have a fantastic opportunity in their life, they just don't, don't even go there. And I think that's the difference between someone who experiences a great deal of success in their life and someone who does not. And when I say success, I'm not talking about starting a a huge company or anything like that. I'm just talking about the successes of like, you know, having the family that you want, um, of being able to go for a run of, you know, uh, like being, feeling successful in your hobby, you know, whatever you're doing in life, like all of that stuff just requires a tolerance to, or a, a, I think a different perspective on what failure is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I would say is that as a human being, I'm trying to move more and more towards the direction of not being ashamed of my failure, like being willing to just let that all be out in the open. And it's amazing, especially when you start running a company, how many people want to hide their failure, which is which is crazy because I like when I was in when when I first got into real estate, I failed a lot mm-hmm. because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I had never worked a job like that. I had never been in sales before. 
Um, I had never sold a house before. I'd never filled out a piece of like a, a contract before. I'd never tried to think of something from a legal perspective before. Like the entire world was completely foreign to me. And so there was lots of opportunity for lots and lots of failure. Um, and, and it was fantastic. Like I learned more in that first, you know, the first two or three months that I was in, in the real estate, I learned a lot of ways to not do things because I failed at a lot of stuff. And, you know, seven months later, I was the number three producer in that office, having never even had an office job before. Um, and then four years later, I was number three in North Idaho. And so like it, like, and I, I think the whole reason for that success is because I was willing to try things that didn't work and then learn from them and try something else and find stuff that did. Yeah. That's all of entrepreneurism or learning something new. Yeah. Or life in general. And I think, you know, you probably, because you had come from something so different, it's not like you was a recruiter and then you went to, you know, selling real estate where there's, you know, similarities in Instead of selling a job, you're selling, you know, a physical, you know, asset or a physical, you know, entity. We, you went from construction, something that was physical, something that was not a desk job, something that was tiring, but maybe not as mentally tiring or, you know, taxing in the same way. And I think you may have, I mean, you probably did. You brought a certain level of experience that the other guy didn't have and you approached it from a different way. And your clients may have, you know, found that refreshing because I know there's been times in my life where I'm talking to, you know, a so-called professional and they're very good at their job, but they just don't see it from a certain, you know, perspective. I remember I was having a bunch of light switches and light sockets, I mean, light switches and sockets put into my house when I moved into this house last year. And one of the switches, because these are all the new smart ones, one of the switches wasn't working because he, you know, he couldn't find you couldn't get a live wire for it in, in that location and he, he, he was trying everything and i remember just after he had gone I, I was literally just on the toilet sitting thinking on the opposite side of the wall is another light switch it, 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 so i messaged him i said is the issue that you just don't have a live wire because if we can get another live wire could this work he was like yeah i was like there's a light switch on the opposite on the opposite side of the wall like exactly on the opposite side can't we as in you just drill through it and access that live wire and he was like ah never thought about doing that but even though that's his job because it's not the way he was probably taught or the sort of process that he would usually do he just didn't even gravitate towards it yep and dude that's amazing it's amazing the perspective you can get from someone who's never done something before mm. i love learning from people who have no experience because like, I don't think people realize they get into ruts, right? And mm -hmm. there's a certain way they want to do things. Um, but you pull somebody in who has zero experience at all, and you explain the situation, and they will give you solutions that will blow your mind at times. Now, oftentimes they're really stupid as well because they don't have perspective. But it's worth asking people because oftentimes you will get out of the box solutions that you could have not thought of on your own because you're in a rut. You know, you're you're doing things the way that you've always done them. And uh, I yeah, I think there's a lot of value in dude, that's why I love masterminds groups and like getting together with other successful people that are completely outside your field of expertise because there's there's so much valuable perspective there um just like you helping out the the electrician in your house like you know you'll come up with solutions that he's not going to think about yeah it's just it's almost like when you have a kid that just keeps asking you know but why but why but you know but why is this well how about this and most of the ideas will probably be silly or you know they won't be valid but then that one time they'll say something and it'll be so simple and you as an adult be like, but why didn't I come up with it? Yep. Yeah, dude, that's, I think that, uh, I think that it requires a significant amount of humility to be able to have relationships with people like that, like to learn from your children or mm -hmm. to learn from people who know nothing. Um, and I, I think that a lot of people really struggle with that because we all have egos, right? And the, our yeah. egos tell us that we need to be experts or we need to be the most important person on the team. And yeah. I really, really try to live my life 
with my ego in check and, and a certain amount of humility because no matter how much experience I, I, um, no matter how much success I experience in my life, I can like, there are always people who, who know a lot less than me, who can teach me significantly more than I can learn on my own. And, uh, and I, that's a journey, right? I, I'm a very independent, very, I would say somewhat arrogant, egotistical person. And I've had to work towards this, this place where I actually have some humility. Um, but that's, that's been, that's been a, that's been a, a long journey. Uh, and it's been a very, very valuable journey for me because I think that a lot of my success can actually be tracked back to really to having the humility to ask for help and to listen to people's perspectives that I don't think are experts. Okay. And like, how have you developed that? Cause that's something that I'm always trying to constantly develop and I know I'm better than I was five, 10 years ago. But I sometimes look at myself and think, you know, I could be better or I feel like there's moments where I sort of regress and then, you know, I, you know, fix it. But like, how have you or how are you continuously trying to become that person where you can step aside, especially when it's in a field or, you know, something that you would generally know more? I think those are the areas that are the most yep. dangerous. Uh, the, you think you should know it, therefore everybody else especially anyone that's not in the field has no, you know, valid perspective. Like how do you deal with that? I would say the number one foundational skill that I've learned that's helped me with that is learning to listen. But I mean a lot more than I think that word means to most people. Cause most people here, they believe that listening is the ability to hear the words that are coming out of other people's mouths. Um, but I, I've found that listening is, is so much bigger than that because you can listen. So my, my big struggle most of my life was that I listened to other people for the purpose of having something to say myself, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted, I wanted to be in the spotlight. And so, you know, if you're, if you're talking and telling me something, I'm going to listen to you for the purpose of responding. And I've discovered that the more valuable kind of listening is listening for the purpose of understanding where what you actually are planning on saying isn't entering your mind at all. You're just planning on, on following someone through the process of that they're going through in their, in their thinking and, you know, in, in their brainstorming or in what they're trying to say. And you're going to follow that all the way through to the end before you even start thinking about your response. And so in doing that, like it, you, you're, you're able to understand them instead of just hear them. And like that skill by itself has helped me in that, in that specific area more than anything else, because it, number one, it requires a significant amount of humility to be able to do that because your pride is always going to jump in and be like, man, you know so much more. Like th this guy's only saying stuff that, you know, like mm -hmm. why, why are you wasting your time uh, trying to listen to them or get down to the bottom of it or really understand them? Um, like they're just going to waste your time. Well, that's arrogance is all that is, uh, you know, that's believing that I have significantly more value than the, the person talking um, or I have significantly more understanding than the person talking. And so for me, that's been the, the, the one thing that I have really focused on trying to do is, I mean, they call it a bunch of different things, but if you look up like active listening, the, you know, the art of active listening, um, and there's a bunch of good books on it. I wish I could remember their names right now, but I, I, I read a ton of them. And the idea is all the same. It's listening for the purpose of understanding rather than listening for the purpose of responding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like most people are so reactionary. Like, I see people like family, friends, they, it's almost like they're just waiting to react. And yeah. it's so many times, not even in a positive way. Because if their reaction was, you know, well done, or that's good, or, you know, that sounds interesting, that wouldn't be, you know, that wouldn't be bad. That'd be fine. But it's always to put somebody down or to, you know, there's, there is positive criticism, and but there's also a time and place for that positive criticism. But when it's just always negative, always in a in the moments when you probably don't need it, it's 
yeah, people are just too reactionary instead of, and and as a result, I feel like those type of people do less well in life as well because they're always reacting to everything, whether that's you know the person directly in front of them, or whether that's media or social media or you know whatever it is. Instead of thinking, you know, I'm gonna act according to the way you know I'm trying to live you know, act according to my, you know, beliefs and my values instead of, you know, always being pulled in every single direction by different people. Remind me of a saying that I heard a few years ago and I try and try and embody, you know, all the time. I do fail sometimes with it, but I try and, you know, in, embody it, it, you know, listen twice, speak once. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I love that saying. Yeah. Well, what is it? Uh, you know, you've got two ears and one mouth. Like mm. that is, that's actually the, that is the proportionally how it's supposed to work. Yeah. And most people talk, you know, three times more than they, than they listen. I mean, it's yeah. amazing. Like you take like a really dumb, dumb example, you know, like if you've got a significant other and you're at work and she texts you and says, Hey, can you grab milk on the way home? And you go home and you forget it. And she's like, Hey, did you pick up the milk? And you're like, no, I didn't. And she's like, well, that was super important. Most people, myself included, uh, if I'm not paying attention, will will immediately think about themselves. Mm -hmm. They're gonna say, "I had a I had a terrible day at work, and that's why I forgot." Or they're going to say, they were busy. You know, "I was on a phone call with my mom, and and I didn't think about it, or I was really busy, or whatever." Right? They're gonna start thinking about themselves, right? And that's the re the reaction side of things. Um, but listening is completely different because the other person just gave you a massive clue right when they're like gosh like i really needed the milk well you could have said like why like what what do you do what are you doing you could actually begin this process of seeking to understand which requires that you lay your ego aside and and you you approach the situation with humility but what could have been a massive fight could actually turn into like a massive relationship building success in, you know, in that significant relationship that you have um, when you actually drop your ego and you try to understand, because what you're going to find out is that, you know, she's got someone coming over in the morning and she's out of milk and she's really, really stressed out about it. And it turns into this, you know, this, this amazing conversation that would have just been a knockdown drag out fight about whose day was worse. Because, you know, you had a terrible day and that's why you forgot it. And she doesn't care about you anyways. And blah, 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 blah. And you go down that 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 crazy rabbit hole. And, and that's every conversation we have, whether or not we're having it with a client, trying to understand what they're trying to build. Or, you know, like I, I've tried to build like my discovery process is, is built around this idea of really under, listening and, and listening for the purpose of understanding. Same thing with the sales process that I have in place. Um, because at the end of the day, people just struggle with that. And I think success comes from being able to take yourself out of the picture and really understand other people in all areas of life. Mm. Yeah, success in, you know, relationships, because I got married or, almost two years ago at the end of 2020. And I know that's something, you know, I've struggled with, like literally that example that you was giving about the mill, that's just like scenarios like that. There's so many times I will, you know, I would have, you know, just reacted and you know, made an you know, maybe about me and, you know, try to almost, it's basically absorbing, absolving yourself of something that you see as a failure, which is, you know, you forgot to bring the milk home or you forgot to grab mm -hmm. this or you forgot to do that. And instead of, you know, trying to work with that person, I know something that I've got a lot better with. I know initially if I was in the middle of work or, you know, I didn't want to be disturbed and uh, didn't want to have to do something else, or if I was, you know, had popped out, you know, grabbed some shopping and I was literally just got at the car park on my way back and my wife would text or ring and say, you know, you know, need this as well. My rea immediate reaction would be, you know, why wasn't he on the list? Why didn't I get told it before? Yep. Whereas now I'm like, it's fine. Just turn the car around, grab it. And sometimes it's been like three, four times, literally go there, go back, go there, go back. And that's an extra hour and a half or so of my day that's been used. And, but now I'm like, that's life, you know, things happen, yeah. things will come up. And ultimately, if you, you know, love that person, if you love, you know, what it is, or you want to connect with that person, then, you know, sacrifices have to be made. And, you know, also to try, try not to see it as a sacrifice and seeing it as something, okay, that's just something 
to do. And, you know, so sometimes I try and think of it as I could be in a position where we, you know, we don't have food, you know, where we're in a country that's, you know, war torn or, you know, a plethora of things that are just bad. And I'm moaning that I have to spend an extra half an hour going back to buy a, an ingredient. Well, when you think about it, an ingredient yeah. for some nice dish that we're going to eat in a couple of hours because we can easily afford that cheap ingredient. Uh, it, it, it's yep. crazy when you think of it, that's what is annoying me in that moment. Yeah, dude, that's a whole other thing that's interesting. Like, <clears throat> I think everybody, especially from like first world countries, you know, like mm. the West, Europe and the US and Canada and those places should go hang out in a third world country because I've spent a significant amount of time hanging out in, in, in very, 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 you know, poverty stricken, destitute countries. And, you, and you know, it's funny because the culture here is like, we need to save these people from their misery. Um, and there's a lot of misery because there's a lot of physical suffering and, and things along those lines that happen. But what's interesting is in the midst of all of that diversity, you actually find happier people there than you do here. Oh yeah. That's like always because, because those, those people like diversity, you know, in a, in a lot of ways simplifies like a lack of things simplify life. And we have like our, it's amazing. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I'll have a friend call me up and be like, you know, my, my hundred and fifty thousand dollar, you know, Tesla plaid broke down and it's the worst day of my entire life. <laughs> and it's like, dude, you just like you've got a hundred and fifty thousand dollar car. And you're you're talking about how somehow it not working is the worst day of your life. Like this it doesn't even make sense. Not when you actually think about it. No. Um and I and I think that getting a little bit of perspective and going and talking to you know, that's why I love, I love traveling. I love going, I I love going to places where, where you actually find out what like happiness and satisfaction are made of, because it's not the things that we chase. It is always something, at least here, it's, it's something very, very different. Um, and people think it's money and they think it's things and they think it's, you know, we just, we, we don't realize that we're chasing things that will never make us happy when no. really like happiness is found in like f the fulfillment of goals that you have and like the simple things in life. Um, I'm a, I'm a pretty big proponent of keeping things as simple as possible. I like to be very focused and I like to be very simple. Um, and, uh, and I think that you can find a lot of joy and a lot of happiness in that. Yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, the, that's definitely something that, over the years, I try to come to terms with as well that you can be very happy. You know, I mean, nothing wrong with wanting money, nothing wrong with wanting stuff, but you know, understanding that getting, like you said, like a hundred fifty thousand dollar car, half million, you know, dollar car, five million dollar car, may make you happy temporarily, but the happiness that you'll get because you've got a good, you know, relationship with your, you know, your spouse, with your kids, you know, with your work colleagues, you know, even. Or if you're doing something yeah. that you really enjoy, like the happiness that you'll get from that is far more than what you'll get from a nice car. Cause you know, cause I've drove, you know, a broken down car, I've drove nice cars and there's still moments where I'm you know, upset or down and the car doesn't really matter. It, it's other stuff. But then again, there, there's been moments when I've had, you know, a rubbish car, but I've been happy because there's, I've been happy for a particular you know, reason it's something you know something totally different to just having you know a nice car you know or whatever it is you know like you were saying about a friend of yours that had the tesla that you know cost him hundred and fifty thousand dollars that he's moaning that he's you know he's broken down it's it's like moaning that oh okay i've got so much money it's taking me so long to count it <laughs> like yeah it, 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 it's a it, it's a problem that or like moaning that oh, I've got so much money that I'm having to buy a bigger safe to store it or more elastic mm -hmm. band to tie it with. <laughs> yeah, no, it's exactly that. And it's silly when you actually put it in perspective. And I think the best way to put it in perspective is dude, go hang out in, in the, in the slums in Mumbai. Yeah. And you can put a little bit of that in perspective when you realize that an entire block makes less money over the course of a year than you're going to make in, oh, yeah. you know, in six months. And that's, and that's if you have like a very, very, you know, average job in the West. 
uh, and that their like their 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 quality of life over the course of their life, if you add up their entire quality of life from when they're born to when they die, is going to be the same quality of life you'll experience over the course of a year. Mm. Um, yet they they have something that you will never buy, and and that's do this joy like uh and people people try to buy that and it's just now i've been broke before like very broke and i've had money before i prefer having money over being broke Mm -hmm. like life's less complicated um but i think that with the wrong mindset life can actually become significantly more complicated when you have money yeah um or success or whatever um, and usually it, it all, most of that is like self-inflicted, right? It's our, it's our egos and our pride getting in the way of being able to enjoy what we have. Yeah. Um, for sure. And if you take those things away, then if you've got like, it, dude, humility is really important. I think at least for me, it is. And one of the things, like if you're completely broke, you, you can, I mean, that's an environment that fosters humility and, and learning and simplicity, which I think is really important for, for human beings. Oh, yeah, for um, sure. You can have that. You can also be filthy rich and have that mm. uh, because it has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with your mindset. Yeah. Mindset. And I'd say the utilization of what you have around you, you know, whether that's money, whether that's people. Again, I don't necessarily mean utilization in a bad way because, you know, people get that connotation when you're talking about people or, you know, you're using them. But, you know, the people that you have or, you know, the tools. Like, the way I like to see money is it's a tool. And like any tool, it has jobs. And if you use the wrong tool for the wrong job, you're not going to be very happy. It's like if you try to make, you know, a fried egg with a hammer, you're going to be a very unhappy person. Or if you try to, you know, hammer in a nail with a whisk, you're going to be a, a very unhappy person in that moment because you, you're just going to get frustrated. And it's the same with money. Like if you're spending it on stuff that inherently will not make you happy, then it's not that money doesn't well, buy you happiness. You're just not yeah. focusing on the right stuff. Like if you focus it on making sure your family's taken care of, you know, they've got good health care, let's say if it's in America where, you know, health care isn't necessarily provided or, you know, you can do a bit of traveling. It doesn't have to be extravagant, but, you know, you can have those freedoms. You're going to be a lot happier than if you bought each one of your kids a Ferrari and you had 10 Ferraris yourself and your wife had 10 Ferraris. You'd be like significantly happier, even if same amount of money has been spent, but just in something a bit more focused, a bit, you know, different. Yep. No, I completely agree with that. Uh, and uh, before you was mentioning that you worked with Vitalik, like how did that come about and what was that experience like and how long did you even work with Vitalik? So worked with is a stretch, okay. uh, but uh, so yeah, so the, the story goes something like this. Um, my buddy had a lot of money um, because he had bought into Bitcoin, you know, early and he had spent a significant amount of money buying at a very low price. Um, and, and, and so he became an angel investor and it was investing in a lot of different projects, kind of got a name for himself in the space doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, he helped run bitcoin.com with Roger Ver for a while. And he just like, he, he really was pretty deep into the old guard, you know, the, the original people, uh, yeah. knew a lot of them and hung out with them. And so, when Ethereum was going to launch mainnet and they were doing their their seed round for it, um, he was approached as an investor, like, hey, you know, you want to buy into this? And when he heard the sales pitch, so he had been trying to convince me to get into the space for a long time, two years. I kept telling him no because of the one big problem that I saw, which was that you have this decentralized like store of value that's immutable and trustless and all that stuff. And that's great. But you have to you have to like integrate that with a web two environment that is none of those things. And therefore all of the value proposition of Bitcoin just goes away. And so when he heard the pitch for um 
when he, when he realized that Vitalik was actually going to do, because there were other people working on it at the time, like um, Rootstock was trying to figure out a smart contract layer or an application layer for Bitcoin. They've been working on it forever. They might still be working on it. I don't know. I haven't looked into it for a long time. But when he found out that like Gavin and, and Vitalik and those guys had actually figured out a real solution that was actually working, there was a test net out um, and they were going to launch a main net, you know, in, in another six months. Uh, he approached me with that cause he felt like that solved all my problems. Um, and so I was actually on <clears throat> an investor call with Vitalik. It was probably 15, 15 of us on the call, um, where he was pitching the idea. Um, and so, and so I think it's a stretch to say that I like personally worked with Vitalik, although that would have been totally awesome. Um, I've got to hang out with him a little bit. Um, you know, he went out to dinner in when he was in, in Denver for, uh, for ETH Denver and, and different things along those lines. But I would, I would not say that him and our friends, uh, or that I, you know, that I worked closely with him. Um, but he is the reason I'm in between the two of them. That's the reason rapid innovation exists. That's the reason I'm in blockchain is because I was very, very inspired by the direction that uh, that this industry is, was, was going and, and the problems that I felt like it could solve. And I, I realized that a smart contract could replace a real estate agent mm -hmm. because the reason real estate agents are involved in a transaction between a buyer and a seller is because the buyer can't trust the seller and the seller can't trust the buyer. And so you need to create a transaction that is trustless and you have to have third parties in the middle of it to, in order to accomplish some semblance of that. But if a smart contract can can facilitate a trustless transaction between a buyer and a seller, then the, a real estate agent becomes obsolete. And so I realized like the, the industry that I was in and that I was trying to be successful in was going to be obsolete. And do I really want to turn this into a career or do I want to join, you know, join forces with the technology that will eventually replace me? And that seemed to make more sense. Okay. And what do you see as the future of crypto and blockchain? Well, that's a massive question. Um, so there's there's two, maybe three things that I really like about blockchain. Um, now, I, I would say first, for people that are listening, there seems to be some confusion between blockchain and cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's all about cryptocurrency. I think some 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 of the crypto stuff that's out there is really interesting. Um, I think some of the some of the crypto stuff that's out there is completely complete garbage. Um, but I think that the technology that makes all of that, whether interesting or complete garbage, a reality, I think all of that is very fascinating to me um, because I see I see blockchain doing a few things really well. Like it it creates efficiency. Um, and there's, there's several examples of that one I just said, like it removes the middleman out of a transaction that needs to be trustless. Um, it's, it's a source of truth, which right now, once again, that's a, that's a, an efficiency thing. Like in order to create a source of truth, we create inefficient systems in order to capture that and audit it and, and regulate it and make sure that we have a source of truth and a blockchain can just be a source of truth without the monitoring in real time. Um, and so I love that it that it removes the inefficiency that is created by the middleman economy. Um, I love that it gives power to people, and so like in, especially in the world today. But you know, say starting back in 1995, 2000 till now, so the last 20 years, we with the with the advent of the internet, we have shifted more and more and more towards this kind of oligarch society um, structure, not even not necessarily from a government standpoint, but from like a corporate standpoint where there's probably a list of 10 corporations worldwide that actually own everyone's information. And information, I, I believe that information, like my information or the cumulative information of society is probably the planet's most valuable resource uh, at the moment because that is where that is 
that it drives entire economies it drives political structures like it 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 just drives so much of what humanity actually is and it's and it's owned by these you know by the this handful of of large corporations and government entities and so when you give that information back to the people and you say hey like you're now the custodian of your own information then that gives a a, a massive resource back to um, back to people. And I love that blockchain can facilitate that and make that happen. And then I also love the possibilities of um, in that same vein of like decentralized autonomous organizations where you have people that are actually creating the regulation that they want to live with as a communal whole um, and corporations running that way where, you know, you've got like employee owned companies uh around the world, but those employee owned companies, the employees are kind of along for the ride. It's like a roller coaster where you stuff the roller coaster or an airplane, maybe where you stuff the airplane full of people and you call it an employee owned airplane. And maybe they even had to pay for the airplane, but there's still a pilot driving it. And that pilot still decides where it's going and what it's doing. And there's a, there's a lot less, um, inf- you just don't have very much influence. And I see blockchain solving problems like that. And so I believe that 15 years from now, there will not be a human being on earth that is not in some way interacting with some form of, you know, decentralized ledger technology. Um, And I don't think it's going to be like the crazy, like everything's on a blockchain, because I don't think that that makes sense for, for lots and lots of things. Like the Web2 world is not going away, in my opinion. Um, it's necessary for so, so, like so many things, but I think that it's going to enhance, uh, what we currently can do. And it's going to level the playing field in a lot of ways that the playing field needs to be leveled for humanity to just have a better, you know, user experience in life. And so, you know, that's, I think uh, it's a little bit philosophical to answer your question, but that's kind of where I see the world like shifting more and more that direction. Um, or at least that's what, what I hope the future looks like. Okay. And you've kind of just touched on it, but I want to ask you, do you think blockchain should be used for all software applications going forward, you know, or just specific ones? And, you know, what type of application do you think leans more towards blockchain technologies in your opinion? So there are some areas where I think a blockchain could uh, could be a part of every single application. I don't know if this will happen or not, but it it would definitely uh, make the user could make the user experience better. Um, so if you imagine a world where where people were no longer designing the back end for at least let's say let's say the the how, how would you best describe this so let's take banking this is probably going to be the best example but you can apply it to a bunch of different things um so we've got money right and our money goes into a bank account and then we've got a ui ux that allows us to go log into the bank account with credentials that they store on their servers and access our bank account and look at our money and we can do different things you know through these portals you know we could we could buy stocks we could do investments we can see the portfolio and then the company that has that set up has designed a ui ux that allows us to see things like interact with our money in different ways and it's that interaction with our money in these different ways that um that actually brings value to us um so whether that's something like mint where you can you know you see your money in the bank and you you're managing your budget or it's something like fidelity where you're going on and you're managing your your investments um or just like your your bank account where you're going in and paying bills and doing different things like that those are all the ux ui experiences that that give this very simple thing that's running in the background value in the web3 world if the money was mine, meaning the money's not sitting in a bank account somewhere uh, as a line item on someone else's servers, then what that does is it allows for this explosion in 
UI UX innovation where people are actually competing on a user experience level because if I don't like the user experience that I'm getting from you, I just go to a different website. I don't create an account because I don't need to. The money's mine. I'm just going to use your UI UX. Um, I don't uh, have to onboard myself. I don't have to. I don't have to do anything. I just connect my wallet because it's my money, my investments, my stuff. And I utilize your UI and your UX um, for what I believe to be a better experience. And you're going to, your your and you're going to give you're you're going to compete with me with your competitors for that better experience. Um, and so I I think I see a world like that existing where it touches a lot of different applications, um, where I I get to hold my value, and then you can move that into like. Uh, like medical records, for instance, I remember when I was working construction, uh, I was, uh, I'd been filing a drill bit and there was a piece of metal that had broken off of it. Um, and when I used it, it flew into my eye. And so I went into the, went into the doctor to have them pull this chunk of metal out of my eye. And, uh, and you know, they had me go and fill out all my paperwork and do all my stuff. And I remember thinking I was probably 17 at the time. I remember thinking like, this is stupid. Like I've been, I've been to hospital before. Like why, why is it that they don't have this? Well, I'd never been to that emergency room and they need all this information. Um, it would be amazing if I had, you know, an app on my phone where all of my medical data was stored, uh, where I was storing all of my medical data. And when I go to the hospital, I just let, I just give them access to it. They see everything. And then when I leave, I can take it back. And if I go to another doctor, another ER, somewhere else, in another country even, I just show it to them. Um, and so I think that's an ideal world that we probably will never live in. But if we move closer to that kind of a user experience, like the actual people who interact with with the world, like the real world, buying, selling, going to the hospital, going to the grocery store, buying gas, you know, paying their electric bill, like that user experience, the user experience of life itself, I think could be increased in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I like that you touched on the example of, you know, the medical industry, because that's one of the problems over the years that I've had with, you know, know, practices where you go there and especially if you're registering someone new, you know, they they ask you to fill out a bunch of registration forms, which include, you know, do you have any medical, you know, problems outside of new medical problems i really shouldn't have to fill out that you know at five years old that i had this or at 10 years old that i had this or i had this injection you know i might not even remember that you know those things anymore whereas if it's on a system that 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 they can easily access and i never understood it especially in the uk where you know it's all nhs you know it's all essentially one umbrella yeah Yeah, like it doesn't make any sense that they don't have it it it, it doesn't make any sense and So, so the one, you know, concern I have with people putting their hopes on blockchain solving it is that it could be much better and effectively solved, even in a centralized manner. It's just the fact that they're not collaborating these organizations, whether the hospitals or departments in government, you know, whatever it is. Because the reality is, like you said, you should be able to go there, give your name. In America, I guess it's social security number. I don't know, maybe something else to uniquely identify you, and that's it. it. You know how you go onto a website, you use the username, password, and that uniquely identifies you. Nobody else is going to have, you know, the username. Like, it, it, you know, it's unique. And, and obviously the password allows you to, you know, get that data. Maybe you have a password for your medical records or some sort of QR code or, you know, some, some sort of time-based thing that's generated well, on your phone. You've just described like a public-private key pair like yeah. you, you uniquely identify yourself with your, with your, you know, your, your public key. And then you prove that that's you with your private key. And then like, you know, that's, that's who you are. And, and I think the reason that sharing doesn't happen is actually like, it's generally, you get these consortiums of people that are disorganized. Like what you've described, the pro- the problem you just described is not having a single source of truth, which blockchains are incredibly good at being a single source of absolute mm-hmm. truth. And so 
I don't know to what extent or how the, these problems actually end up getting solved um, because there's a there's a bajillion problems and people who are listening are probably like, yeah, well, what about, you know, and there's a list, a long list. Uh, you know, what about privacy and what about, you know, someone hacking in and getting information that they shouldn't have? And, you know, what about all these things? And there's a bajillion of them. Um, you know, really smart people are going to solve those problems. Uh, well, you know, they're the smart, I talk to people who are significantly more intelligent than I am every day that are coming up with like wildly creative, amazing solutions to like problems that need to be solved. Um, and the blockchain side of the solution is absolutely necessary for, uh, you know, for, for a lot of these key elements. I don't think it's going to be the end all be all like web two will exist. It has to like, there's certain things that need to be centralized. Um, there's, there's, there's certain restrictions inside, you know, public blockchains that you like, you probably shouldn't put everyone's medical record on public blockchains, but it's a terrible idea. And so there's, you know, there's certain compromises and certain things that are going to have to happen for, for, and regulations that need to be met and discrimination laws and, and different things along those lines. But I believe that, blockchain will play a role in in solving some of these just ux problems with life in my opinion yeah no in so uh, so so many areas yeah i overall agree and i think in general even if people don't necessarily use blockchain hopefully it opens up their mind to you know a different way of doing things a way where it is there is more collaboration and you know more connection and just in general where they can you know access data that needs to be accessed in you know a way that just makes sense especially in this day and age because fundamentally yeah. there's no technical reason why they can't collaborate and you know do stuff but it's whether or not the organizations and also whoever's funding those organizations and their motives if they're happy to use that technology it's like that's like the one concern I have. And that's not blockchain related necessarily. That's as it's in general. Like the the infrastructure might be there, the API might be there, you know, the data might be accessible in a good way. But if who whoever needs to access it, if who's in charge of that organization doesn't approve for whatever reason of the system, it, it doesn't matter if it's accessible. So if you go to a hospital and say, Okay, you know, I've got this app which ninety nine percent of hospitals are using and they say, yeah, we're not using it. What can you do? You know, outside of government legislation that, you know, makes it illegal not to, you know, use something and forces them to use something, there's very little you can do. And I think that's one of the concerns that I have. And I just, I, I just want, like, I, I'm a big advocate of blockchain, of crypto technologies, Web3, and I'm really interested in that space. But I just want people you know, that are listening just to think about it a bit deeper and think that, even if technically it can be solved with you know blockchain, doesn't mean it necessarily is because you know there's still human actors at play yep. that have to make the decisions. Yeah. Well, and I see like the immediate solutions being things like what like Boeing, if you look at them. So like Boeing builds airplanes, right? But they don't mm -hmm. manufacture all the parts for the airplanes. No. And so what you get is you get this, you get a consortium of people that are working together. Um, to build airplanes, right? There's a bunch of companies. Well, what's interesting is those companies don't necessarily trust each other. And so like a very, very, here's a very simple problem uh, that is it is currently being solved with blockchain right now. Um, company A is manufacturing the metal brackets that are going to fit inside of the airplane. Um, company B is metal, is is fabricating the body of the airplane itself. And then company C being Boeing is actually putting these airplanes together. And so company A and company B aren't talking to each other um, or they haven't communicated well. And the holes for the seat brackets are in the wrong spot. And so they're all building away, right? And they go to assemble their first airplane and there's a problem. They don't fit together. And so the people building the airplane go tell their boss, hey, this isn't, this isn't working. Uh, that, you know, we're, it's not getting fit together. And by the time everything gets fixed in the traditional system, company A has built a billion dollars worth of seat brackets. 
Um, company B has built a billion dollars worth of, of, you know, cabins for the airplane. And, and now there's like a massive amount of loss of just waste, uh, because now you've got to have company D come in and build it, you know, build something that is going to meet the FDA's requirements for safety. That's now going to allow the seats to be bright. And so there's just waste, right? Well, in an, in an ideal world, what would have happened is that company C, so Boeing, would have went to install the first seat, would have seen that it didn't work. They would have put that input into a private blockchain um, that is shared with companies A and B. And it would have said, hey, these don't work. And immediately it could have changed because immediately that feedback shows up on, on chain and is validated by someone else who's trying to do the same installation. And billions of dollars are saved. Um, and this is a massive problem for consortiums that are doing manufacturing together. Um, and it's currently being solved with blockchains that allow real time feedback and, and just efficiency in the market between companies that don't necessarily trust each other. Um, same thing with, with like overstock, you know, like if you get someone who's, and this is more, you see this with like, uh, people who are manufacturing computer chips, you know, if you've got someone who's assembling computers and they're selling them like Dell, let's say, and they're they're buying their chips from, you know, from whoever, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, there's no, there's not a lot of communication between the two companies. I mean, they try, they do the best they can, but there's not a lot of good communication between the two companies about how many chips Dell's going to need in order to get the, their computer lineup put together. And so company, if, if the company who's manufacturing the processors, let's say, is is not paying attention um, or not communicated well with, then they're going to manufacture way too many. And if they manufacture way too many a year later, those chips are no longer worth what they were today. And so that once again, you know, it can be billions and billions of dollars just wasted. And so I see blockchains, especially amongst consortiums of enterprise companies that are manufacturing things as a way to create effective communication between companies that don't necessarily trust each other with a, single source of truth because Dell doesn't want to open up its database to, you know, the companies manufacturing the chips. They don't want them to see everything. They just want them to see a small, you know, a small part of what's going on. And company B is manufacturing the chips doesn't, doesn't want to tell Dell everything. And so if they both are, you know, interacting with a private chain and just, just putting the da- data on there that is true, it gives both it gives all the companies involved a single source of truth that they can start making good decisions on, which eliminate waste. And I see that as a like a, as some of the low hanging fruit that we're going to continue to see happen in the space uh, through like all of our manufacturing and supply chain. And um, and, and, you know, I don't think we're going to tackle medical records first. Uh, or, or some of the big, you know, s- sticky kind of, kind of scary stuff. I think that stuff comes after we've learned how to do this on a, on a smaller scale, but in a way that has a massive impact on humanity anyways, because now the price of an air airfare ticket is lower because they don't have to make up for a massive amount of waste in the manufacturing process. Um, oh, yeah. and so like that's, you know, I, I don't know. And I'm, my crystal ball is always a little bit fuzzy. There's always people who challenge the things that I believe. I'm always learning every day and kind of changing my my opinions based on new information. But, uh, but I'm watching these solutions get implemented. You know, I'm, I'm watching Boeing save $7 billion a year uh, because they've implemented a blockchain solution. And I tell you what, when there's those kind of numbers on a balance sheet, uh, there's, there's, there are more people who are going to start taking this technology very, very seriously because seven billion dollars a year is a lot of money. Oh yeah. Um, and even if it's just capitalists trying to put more money in their pocket, that's a pretty big motivation. Um, oh, and yeah. then you know, free markets reduce prices, and and consumers have a better experience because uh, the cost goes down, and all of a sudden, you know, the user experience of humanity is upgraded, and that's a overall a good thing. So yeah. Okay, and in simple terms, how would you describe to the average person that has little to no technical knowledge, or the average person that you meet on the streets, how would you describe blockchain, web free, and cryptocurrencies without using too much technical jargon? Because I see loads of descriptions 
of whether it's Bitcoin, blockchain, Web3 online. And, you know, I'm interested in the space. I'm a tech guy, so I understand what they're saying for the most part. But when the average person will see it, it's just like, it's just, it's like, it's like the same thing said. It's almost like they're just repeating a Wikipedia, you know, entry. And yeah. it, 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 you just feel, hear those few same words, you know, it's decentralized, you know, it's, it's ledger, you know, you hear those few words and it's like, okay, but for the average person, how would you describe it? So, um, I would, I would probably, at least on the, on the blockchain side of things, I would, I would tell people to imagine that they've got a group of people, 10 people that... Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll have a sheet of paper and they're trying to keep track of, uh, of money that they're all the custodian of, right? So you guys all have a hundred bucks and you're trying to keep track of it. Um, and then imagine that you could write down on that piece of paper, what it is you're doing with your, and, and you all head out to go buy, um, you know, supplies for a barbecue that you're going to do with your hundred dollars and you're all doing different things. Imagine if you if that sheet of paper could be updated in real time and fully trusted, um, because there's a consensus mechanism which I wouldn't get into uh, that allows you to fully trust everything that's on the paper, on who's spending what and what's happening um, in real time, and that's really the value proposition that blockchain adds to the world because you aren't going to. Like you're going to know what's happening. You're going to have a source of truth of what's happening with that hundred dollars as people are going out and doing things with it. Um, I think that's the, that's the simplest explanation for, for what a blockchain is. Now, if you want to get into how it works, which is usually the next question, I tell people to go on YouTube and, and research it because it's, that's longer than a simple conversation. Although I'm sure there's people who are, who would be better at explaining explaining it than I, you know, than I am? Yeah, um, no, I, honestly, I like the explanation. It was, you know, you didn't, you know, I don't think you use the word decentralized or ledger. I mean, you were you were describing it, but you wasn't using those terms again and again. Okay, that's blockchain. How would you describe Web three and cryptocurrencies relative, or you know, in comparison to that, then to the average person? Yeah, so I, I I usually describe cryptocurrency in two. It depends on what people are talking about. Like, there's a store of value, um, and so there's something like the equivalent to cash. Um, but instead of it being numbers in a spreadsheet at your bank, um, they're numbers on that piece of paper that we talked about, and uh, you're the only one who has access to them and can move them around. And so that would be like a, a currency, like something that you're actually planning on storing your value in and then exchanging it for goods and services. Um, and then there's the utility token, um, which is, which I usually would have a different explanation for. Um, and I usually describe utility tokens as Chuck E. Cheese tokens, like, or, or some, you know, arcade tokens where it's a it's a currency that allows you to interact with a specific service or a business and 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 accomplish the thing you want to accomplish you know like when you, when you go to an arcade at least in the olden days back when i used to and you, they would give you tokens you could play the games with those tokens um and and the tokens themselves could be exchanged for a currency you'd get the token and then that gave you the utility of using the arcade and so you got the experience that you wanted um and uh, and so that would be cryptocurrency and, and, uh, in, in, in what I see as the kind of the two main categories, I mean, it gets complicated if you really want to try to dig into it. Um, and then web three, like for me, web three is wrapped up in the simple concept of imagine that on any computer, anywhere in the world, on any application, you can log in with a single username and password and access all of your data uh, in a completely secure way. You can, you never have to sign up for another social media platform. Again, you just log in and you're, you already have an account because you're the one holding your information. And so when you sign up for Twitter the first time, you just put in your, you know, you put in your private, your public key, you sign a transaction and bam, you have an account. All your information is already there. You switch banks, do the same thing. All your information's there. Just a seamless experience through, uh, you know, through a system that has one underlying 
it's it's like if the entire world decided to use a single backend for everything. Um, you know, you would you could access that backend from any UI or UX. And and that's kind of the thing that excites me most about Web3. A little bit ambitious. Who knows what that actually looks like in reality, but that's the potential that I see. And so usually okay. I describe it like that. You know, you want to switch from you want to switch from bank A to bank B. You don't create an account, you don't move your money, you don't do anything, you just log in and it's there. You just log in. Okay. And on a sort of side question, do you own any cryptocurrency yourself and which ones? Oh gosh, this is not financial advice. No, no, no. Uh, I, I, obviously, I'm not looking for that. And I'm not uh, anyone that's listening. This is not a financial advice podcast, and I don't think you really should be getting solid financial advice off a podcast, no matter who's doing it. But I, I, I'm just interested to see or hear, you know, where your sort of split is. Is it all just sort of yeah. Ethereum star based, or do you have more conventional ones yeah, like Bitcoin cool. as well? Yeah, so I, I mean, I kind of like I, I play mostly. So number one, I'm not a, I'm not a trader, right? I, I'm not a guy who goes and tries to make money by playing the emotions of the market when it comes to blockchain. I'm a buy and hold guy. Everything that I've ever uh, invested in in the blockchain space has always been very long term thinking. Um, but so all the like the blue chips and for me blue chips are like in a, in a bear market blue chips get very small like ethereum and bitcoin um and then i've always got like the the projects that i'm interested in like uh like right now one of the projects that i'm there's probably two projects i'm i'm interested in at the moment uh from a from like a i wonder if they're going to do well i think they've got the potential to this will be interesting um, one of them is Thorchain. I think that's fascinating. Uh, if they can solve their, their problems and figure out how to actually do real decentralized cross-chain communication, um, that is, that's an amazing piece of technology that's absolutely needed. They'll go, they'll go very, very far. Um, and so Thorchain, I'm really interested in. The other one is, is Fuel, uh, Fuel Network, um, because they are reinventing how smart contracts are written. Um, because I, I think what people don't really realize is that Solidity was a POC, like it was a hacked together version of JavaScript that was never supposed to be permanent. And then this entire infrastructure got built around it. And so now it still exists, but it's not a very efficient language to be creating smart contracts and like smart contracts really ought to be written in Rust or something that's a little bit closer to the machine. And, uh, and so what the guys at fuel have done is they have created a, a, another chain. Um, but they've also created another language from the, from the ground up based on rust, which is going, which is significantly, I mean, 10 times more efficient than trying to use a JavaScript based language. So I'm very, very fascinated with, uh, with both of those projects. I think that both of them have the potential to do very, very well. Okay, and what do you think of Bitcoin? So I love Bitcoin for a couple of reasons. One, like it's it's the beginning of my journey. There's some sentimental value attached to Bitcoin. Um, I think I think that Like I think that the fact that Bitcoin is still around today, and that there, like we haven't been able to make this transition to utility chains, where it's like, ooh, Bitcoin's obsolete now. I think that that is proof that Bitcoin has a purpose, and that people believe in that in that purpose. I think there's enough people that do that will, you know, we will we'll see continued use of Bitcoin. Um, and I I don't I just don't I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, the things that I, I, what I don't like about Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is, it's, I, it's a love hate thing. It's very simple. It's about as simple as a, as a blockchain, uh, you know, as a blockchain can be. Um, and its simplicity removes utility because there's a certain, 
you know, there's a certain level of utility you get from like a smart contract chain like Ethereum or from something like Polkadot or, you know, from something like, uh, like fuel, uh, that you're not going to ever get out of something like Bitcoin. Now I know there are people working on other layers and you've got things like the lightning network and, and other utility that's kind of built onto it. And I think that that's good. Um, but, but the simplicity I think is it's, is, is the one piece that I, that I kind of love about it. And also don't, if that makes sense, it's kind of a weird answer to your question, but I have a bit of a love hate relationship with it because I'm a developer. Honestly, there's not a ton of really like fun, exciting things you can go do with Bitcoin as a developer. Mm -hmm. There just isn't. It's, it's limited, like very limited. And Ethereum is pretty limited. You know, the EVM is pretty limited on what you can do. And so when you limit it even more, uh, it just kind of becomes boring from a, like from a development standpoint. Okay. And what blockchain does rapid innovation or blockchains does rapid innovation ideally use for their clients? What's the go-to ones? Obviously, I know you'll depend probably on the scenario, but what are the sort of go-to ones, especially for different scenarios? Yeah, so I, I mean, I break it down into languages because that makes it a little bit easier. I think there's probably 30 different blockchains that we're pretty proficient at building on. Um, and so Solidity, which that, I mean, you get like f 15 very, very popular languages right there. Um, Rust. And so once again, you're going to get a, bu a bunch of stuff that you can build on uh, with Rust and then um, uh, C++ based languages. Um, and so it ends up being probably 30 different blockchains that we're proficient with. Um, and then you add some of the enterprise stuff on there as well, actually, to be fair. So like the, the Hyperledger suite um, and some of the more like dedicated uh, private, uh, private chains. Um, we, we do a, f a fair amount there as well. Okay. And your company helps people create their own, you know, blockchain, you know, applications. Have you or rapid innovation created your own blockchain based applications and released them? Um, so we've created some stuff. We haven't ever released it. A lot of what we, what we have done <laughs> Um, because like some of our value proposition is helping people get to market very, very quickly. And so the, one of the foundational pieces of, of being able to do that is to create a lot of the building blocks that make up a blockchain application and kind of have them in our tool bag so that we're not creating that from scratch. And so we're a hybrid between the, uh, the fully custom development where we start from nothing and we're going to go and just build something from scratch for you and the guys who sell software out of a box and white label it. Um, we, we sit a little bit in the middle so we can make things very, very quickly. We can iterate. And so we kind of start with the, with the skeleton and then uh, build it out from there. Um, but aside from that, uh, there's there, I guess there is one product that we built weird story around it. I mean, it was a, it was a, a partnership that fell apart and we were in charge of the tech. And so we had finished building it when the, when the partnership fell apart, which is drama that I won't get into, but, um, and so like we built that, we never released it. It's still just sitting there. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're not right now, we're not really a product company. We are getting into building some products, but those products are really developer products. Um, and to make entrepreneurs entrepreneurs life easier, they're not like in consumer products. Um, and so, you know, our focus is on the tooling involved in, you know, in this space and, and what needs to be built as far as the, you know, developer tools and, and, and that stuff goes. And we've got internal stuff that we're working on that eventually will be released uh, as, as tooling that the public can use. Okay. And how do you foresee blockchain being used in industries like gaming, movies, and music? Dude, I'm excited about, about all of those, actually. Um, so imagine a world, right, where you've got a DAO 
that governs like um, that governs a uh, a entertainment studio, let's say a movie studio. And so you've got this group of people who are like, hey, this is the next movie that I want you to make. And there's a group of people that are kind of putting together the cost and all that stuff. And then the movie is sold in 15 minute second NFTs and people can go and purchase those NFTs um, and own a portion of that movie, fund its creation. Uh, directors are hired, actors are hired. The entire movie is then created. Um, and then when it goes to the box office and it produces a, a result, i.e. people enjoy it and they pay money and they want to go watch it. Everybody who invested into the 15 second or one minute or five minute, doesn't really matter, um, clips of the movie. Um, so the actual duration of the movie, those people are then paid a royalty because they helped invest in that movie. And they also like, and then the public was like, Hey, this is a movie we want to see. Um, you know, and I think if we do some stuff like that, you won't get 10,000 Avengers movies and it won't turn into a meme. You know, you'll get things that people actually really want to see. Um, and there'll be a little bit more involvement in the creation of the things that we consume. I love the idea of stuff like that coming into existence. Um, I think it also gives like musicians the power to like cut out the the record label middlemen, which we do see some of that happening even in the Web2 world. I think the market wants to go there. It just really struggles to do that. Um, and I think that blockchain is going to revolutionize the music industry in that way, that it can create efficiency by cutting by being direct to consumer. Um, and and you can build brands around it and and uh, you know, you can have fan governed, uh, your record, record labels through DAOs and things along those lines. Um, okay. and in the gaming industry, I think there's a lot of things that could happen. Um, I hope that the next bull run is built on gaming personally, uh, because I think that there's a lot more power that these game studios have than people think. Um, you know, if you, I've got a friend who spends a lot of money playing games, like a lot of money. <laughs> and he owns nothing at the end of the day when he's done spending that money. He owns nothing. You know, he owns the right to experience the game. And that's it. And I think that I think that digital ownership could revolutionize that in some ways. I think that it, we're probably going to go too far. We're probably going to do a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense. You know, there's going to be innovation happening that needs to be thrown in the garbage. But I do think that we're going to find a way to create real ownership of the digital world. Um, and when people buy buy things in games, they can actually be the real owner of those things and benefit from ownership, which is it's an area where people spend a lot of money and they benefit from, they have no ownership. They, there's no beneficial ownership of anything. And I, I think that that, uh, I think that that tr we'll, we'll see a shift away from that trend um, in, in the gaming side of things. So I think that answers your question. Yeah. Sounds good. Where do you see blockchain's involvement in artificial intelligence and machine learning? And how is rapid innovation getting involved in those areas as well? Yeah, so I've got... So I see... When, when a lot of people talk about Web3, people talk about Web3 as blockchain. Um, I, mm. I don't see it that way necessarily. I see Web3 as four main pillars. Um, blockchain, AR, VR, um, AI, and machine learning, um, and IoT. And so I think that the web, the web three of the future will be built on those four pillars. Um, and so with that being said, uh, I actually have an AI team um, that, uh, that is, in my personal opinion, very specialized because this AI team, although they're, they, they have a, uh, a significant understanding of AI and, and machine learning, they also understand blockchain. And uh, I don't think there are a lot of people who have crossed over and really are experts in both. Um, and the reason that I decided to build that division of rapid innovation is because I do see this dichotomy between um, a, a single source of binary truth, yes or no. Um, versus this like 
general truth that an, that an AI is joining together and doing things. Like one of the things I'd love to see happen, and I, I had a conversation with a guy the other day, um, and it's actually going to be more complicated than I thought it was going to be. Um, but I would love to see proof of useful work because if you look at the insane number that the world pays today to train AIs to do things like drive a car around or, you know, listen to my voice and transcribe it to text and, and things along those lines, you know, create pictures out of nothing. Like the, the amount of money that we spend in electricity training artificial intelligence to do things for us is, is insane. The amount of money that we spend on proof of work is insane. Um, they're both just crunching numbers. Now it's more complicated than that. <clears throat> and for everyone out there who actually knows this more complicated than that, I know that I'm oversimplifying it, but I would love to see proof of useful work. Um, like, um, BitTensor is a great example of a company that's really trying to solve this problem. There's a few others out there as well, um, where they're trying to actually create proof of work blockchains or proof of work blockchains that train artificial intelligences. And so you're, you are proving you're, you're providing consensus to the network by doing work that's useful for humanity. Um, and so I, I love seeing that. Um, I think that like a, an AI, you have to have very accurate, very binary data to train AI and blockchains produce very accurate, very binary data. Um, and so I think that we'll see blockchains, uh, assisting in the labeling of data for, um, uh, for AI to actually train with, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure yet, uh, what it all looks like, but it is something I'm excited about. And I do think the future is going that direction, at least in some way. Okay. And how would you describe NFTs to the average person? Like the way you describe blockchain and crypto and web free and what work is rapid innovation doing in the NFT space? Dude, rapid innovation was building stuff in the NFT space before NFTs were called NFTs. Um, I forget what we called them back in the day, but there was no standard for it. I think we were calling like u- unique identifier tokens or something like that back before someone coined the frame non-fungible token. Um, so number one, NFTs are a touchy subject for me. Um, I don't see anything wrong with with taking a picture of a monkey and saying that and and loading up the metadata inside a non-fungible token and saying like here's the picture of the monkey and it's in the metadata of a non-fungible token like there's nothing wrong with profile pictures um and owning a profile picture Um, but i think that that is a colossal waste of the opportunity inside uh inside the technology that an nft actually is because what an nft is is it's a token um, that isn't fungible. And so how I describe it very simply is that a dollar is fungible. You can take a dollar and you can break that dollar down into individual pieces. Um, you can break it into pennies, you can break it into dimes, you can break it into nickels, or quarters, like it's, it's fungible. Um, a, a car is non fungible. Uh, it's unique, um, or actually a better example, a piece of art, the Mona Lisa, the Mona Lisa is non fungible. If you took the Mona Lisa and you cut it into a hundred pieces, uh, it would no longer be worth anything, uh, because it has no value when you break it into little pieces. And so that's all fungibility is right. Is the ability for something to retain its value as it's, as it's broken into smaller pieces, a dollar still is worth a dollar. Even if you break it into a hundred pieces, um, the Mona Lisa is not worth whatever it's worth if you break it into a hundred pieces. Um, and so that's all a non-fungible token is, is it's a token that uniquely identifies something. Um, the very first application we built, uh, that was a non-fungible token based application was actually a competitor to, uh, DocuSign. And the idea was that you would build a token that had the metadata of a document inside of it. Um, and it had fields that allowed two people with wallets that were KYC'd in another smart contract um, to be able to um, 
to be able to sign a transaction that says that they agree with the information in the metadata on this non-fungible token. And then we built a front end that would display that token as a PDF. Um, and so you could basically sign a PDF and it was an actual piece of information um, or this token that could have two people's signatures on it um, that could be stored on a blockchain. Uh, and then from there, we've done tons of stuff, like tons and tons and tons of stuff from real estate projects uh, to your typical like NFT drops where people are trying to create collectibles um, to very, very interesting marketplaces um, to people tokenizing real world art to real world artists creating art on the blockchain and selling it. Um, all, all, all kinds of interesting things. Okay. And what tech stack does your company use? So it's a, a few of them now, actually, because we've, we've got like, as we've gotten bigger, we can kind of do, we can do a lot of like, I would say most of the mainstream tech stacks. Um, but we, we started on the mean stack uh, and kind of grew, grew from there. Um, but at, I mean, at this point it really, like if, if somebody comes to us and says, Hey, you know, I, this is how I want, this is the tech stack that I want. I can assemble a team that can work on that tech stack and is very proficient. And so we're, I mean, we've got so many people now, uh, that we can kind of custom build a team to do whatever somebody wants. Okay. And because you got all, you know, those people, how much of it is remote working and how much of it is on site? And what's your opinion opinion on remote versus on site working? Um, I love remote work. So this company was built around the idea of being remote. Um, okay. We don't, we, we have an office. Uh, we, we bought an office in Goa on the beach. It's got 32 different rooms and a cook that makes food and a co-working space in a pool and anyone can go to the office anytime they want and hang out there and work together. Um, it's always full and I don't have any, you have to go to the office policy because it's pretty nice to hang out at a little resort on the beach in Goa. Um, and I, I don't think I ever want to do anything more than that for an office. I might create a school uh, because I do want, that's something that's in the future for us is, is creating a, a blockchain focused uh, school for people who really want to get into this space. Um, and I'll probably do it in the same style, find a really interesting place on earth that people really want to go and buy a, a hotel or something like that and build out a co-working space and, and uh, train people there. Um, but I, I don't think it really matters that much whether or not people have an office or not. I believe that, the results that people produce should be all that matters. Um, it's a little bit, it's, it's significantly more complicated than that, but at, at you know, at its base, I, that's kind of my philosophy. And so I don't ever want to have a, uh, a physical location that people are required to go, but I do want to have physical locations that people can go if they want to collaborate and have that community, because that seems to be something that, uh, that people really need. And so I want to provide that. Uh, but I, I'm certainly not going to require it. And I really encourage the digital nomad lifestyle, like go anywhere <clears throat> in the world that you want to go and enjoy your life. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and do your, do your best work and live your best life. Yeah. I think that's fair enough. You get the work done. If you're in the office, you're at home, or you're on the beach, what does it really matter? Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. No. Okay, and did Rapid Innovation raise any funding? And if so, how did you go about that? And how did it help the company become what it is today? Um, so we did raise funding, um, uh, pre-seed. Uh, we've talked about raising more. Um, I get approached twice a week from people who... <laughs> would like to invest. Um, and we, 
we may at some point in order to help us grow more. But as of right now, like, like we're fortunate to have been it, get into this space early um, to find some very talented people to do a very good job. Um, and we've been able to grow just based on that reputation and the, and the quality of the work that we, that we produce. And so um, we haven't needed to raise money. we actually didn't need to raise money when we did. It was a, we had my very, very first client uh, needed, basically needed some to, to make some investors happy for some of his projects. And the easiest way to go about doing that was get him a seat on the board and do a small investment. And so, uh, and so we, we raised a, a little bit of money um, probably a year and a half ago now, maybe. Um, but we, you know, it, it is, it is probably in the future. I just don't know when, um, okay. we've talked about doing it even maybe the beginning of next year. Um, and, uh, you know, just, it would help us to grow. Like there's some things that we could do that would make rapid innovation much better than it is because when you have money, that's resource that you can put into, um, you know, user experience, which at the end of the day, we're a user experience company, you know, our clients need to have the best user experience possible. And so, you know, money helps you build that user experience and, and, or at least do it faster. And so we, we might, if we get to a point where we feel like our foundation is good and we can accelerate growth without compromising quality. Um, but there seems to be a lot of appetite. I mean, I get approached all the time for people who either want to buy us as a company, which that's not not going to happen, uh, or at least you know buy in and be a part of it. Okay. Would you guys ever do an ICO? Have you considered an ICO? And do you do ICOs for other people? So, uh, first question was: Would we do an ICO? I yeah. don't know. Uh, unknown question mark on that one. Okay. Um, have we considered doing an ICO? Yes, uh, we have. Uh, it's been a it's been a topic of conversation a couple of times. Um, and do we help other people do ICOs? Yes, um, we've done a lot of helped a lot of people do ICOs and IDOs and all the other EOs that are out there. Okay, and can you talk about some of the ICOs that you've done? Are are you at liberty to state which ones that you've been part of? Um, not offhand. I'd have to go, I, I have to go through my, <laughs> to go through my list of NDAs. Dude, here's one of the things that's interesting, right? Let's pretend that you decided you wanted to build something amazing, uh, yeah. but you didn't want to assemble a dev team. So you call me up and I'm like, yeah, I'll build that for you. And then imagine it's wildly successful. Like you, yeah. you get into the like top 10, you're world famous in the blockchain space. Do you want me as a company going out and being like, Hey, I built that. Probably not. And I think most of our clients feel that same way. So we get to be the humble company that sits in the background, having done some really, really amazing stuff. Uh, and we don't get to really brag about it publicly, um, especially with the ones I'd really like to brag about publicly. Yeah. Um, but I mean, what I can say is we've had, you know, we've had uh, companies that we've, that we've worked for that, that were able to, you know, in the, in their first three months of launch have, you know, several billion dollars locked up in liquidity and like some very, very successful, uh, very, very successful launches that are still out there today. Um, okay. and also gotten to work with some really, really cool people, um, like work, work with the Vaynerchucks on, on some of their projects and, um, just some, some really, really, uh, cool, cool people in the space. Okay. And what advice would you give to the average non-technical person looking to get into blockchain and crypto and just, just trying to learn more about it? And also, same question, but for a technical person that's looking to get into it from a more development perspective. So to the average person, I would say research. Do lots and lots of research because... Um, when I didn't know what I was doing, uh, I made mistakes and I got scammed and I did stupid things and I lost, I lost a lot of money. Um, 
And if I had just taken a little bit of time and educated myself, that would not have happened. And so find someone, a mentor in the space or, or do your own research, like really, really educate yourself. Um, and, and work with people that have a, a really trusted, uh, track record. So like, you know, I've got a guy, a client right now who's never been in the blockchain space. He doesn't know anything at all. Um, comes from a completely different background, but wants to build a really, really fascinating, very cool application. Um, and, uh, in fact, I think I've got a testimonial that'll be popping out from him here in a little bit. So you can check social media for that. Uh, I think that's our official, I don't have to worry about our NDA anymore. Um, but like he did a lot of research, found a company that he felt would really be able to help him, um, from that perspective, being non-technical to build something really, really neat in the space that I think is going to be very successful. Um, and or at least has the potential to be very successful if he plays his cards right. So really just find people that you absolutely trust. Like do do research if you're looking to get into the space and build things. And then from the like from a technical perspective, like if you're looking to become a developer, like I just say jump in and, and make mistakes and and start learning. Like there's a lot of ways to learn to um you know learn learn this space and really understand like go go in and understand the fundamentals you know like dig deep in into stuff so that you're so that you understand how a blockchain actually works from a technical level before you start writing inefficient crappy code that you're gonna have to refactor later um you know do do your research uh and have fun um and then the other thing would maybe tech stack and this is temporary advice mm -hmm. i believe that rust is more important uh, to learn than solidity at the moment. Um, simply because I believe that that's going to be, uh, the, the smart contracting language of the future. Now that opinion has changed multiple, multiple times since I've been in the space. Um, but, uh, that is my current, uh, that is my, my current thought on what the future of blockchain looks like. And so if you're looking to get in and like, start, you know, start, developing i would put put a little bit of time and, and effort into learning rust okay good advice and yeah that's i've got a, a bunch more questions but i'm gonna save that for hopefully another time that you'll come onto the podcast jesse because i think we've had a good couple of hours now before we wrap up is there anything that's come to your head that you just want to share or say before we wrap up Dude, this was the longest podcast I've been a part of. Thank you for that. And it, I, it, man, the time went by fast. I really enjoyed the conversation. I, mean, um, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no, dude, that was fun. I usually don't get to get into like the philosophical stuff or mm. any like you know the 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 pieces, the foundational pieces of who I am as a person. I actually really appreciate being able to talk about that because I think it's more important than a lot of the other stuff that we talked about, I don't know that other people agree with me, but to me it's more important. And so that was, that was fun to be able to have that conversation because it doesn't happen very often. Um, and then, yeah, you know what? I, I would just say to everybody listening, like if you're curious about this space or, or you have ideas, like start pursuing them. And I mean, I watch a lot of, I, I hear a lot of people tell me that they, like they had this brilliant idea and they waited two years and someone else did it and they were very successful. That is life. Like that's what happens when you don't take that first step. Kind of what we were talking about earlier. Like if you want to walk a mile, you have to take your first step. Mm. And, uh, and you know, I would love it if people's first step was rapid innovation because that helps me succeed. And, and hopefully I can help, you know, I can help other people be successful in the process. But, um, even if it's not like I'm passionate about innovation in this space, like just do something like start moving somewhere and, and take action um, because I think the world needs more innovators. Love the advice. It. Before we wrap up, quick question. What books, because you mentioned that, you know, you know, you love reading. What books would you recommend that aren't necessarily the obvious ones like Think and Grow Rich that everyone recommends? Like what books would you recommend for reading just in general? Um, so the, uh, the E-Myth uh, is, a, is a phenomenal book that I read every single year. 
Um, Principles by Ray Dalio is another book that I read every single year. Um, the Aladdin Factor, if you're into sales, which I am, I really enjoy that side of things. That's another book that I that I've really enjoyed. Um, let's see, what's a what's a what are a few more that are like off the beaten path? Um, oh, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Uh, that's a that's a very interesting book. Uh, if you like. If you like fiction, it's like a, a book for entrepreneurs and management style stuff, but told in like story form, which was interesting. Um, and then, oh, what's, what's another impact? Uh, Atomic Habits. That was a phenomenal book for people who are procrastinators and uh, and struggle to get things done, which I'm, I, I am one of those people. And uh, that's one of the books that helped me overcome some of that. Uh, the four disciplines of execution. If you're looking to build a, 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 a company, um, a real company, that's another one. Uh, that's, that's very good. But my, my go-to book, like my number one entrepreneurial book is E-Myth. The E-Myth. I love that E-Myth. book. It was very, very impactful for me. Um, and then principles okay. is, is the other one because I, I love, I love, I love philosophical systems and, uh, and processes. And I feel like that book embodies how to put a company together based on a set of like principles and, and a philosophy, um, rather than a set of paper processes that people have to follow for no reason. And I think that you that your decision makers, your leaders inside your company, and even you as a leader can make much better decisions and move way, way faster. If you, if you have a foundation of principles that govern uh, the decision making inside what you know your your decision making or your leader's decision making. So those those two books I can't recommend. I mean they're, they're phenomenal books. And then Atomic Habits. If I was going to have give you three, it would be those three. Those three. Okay. Yeah, I've read Atomic Habits before. I've heard the principles by Ray Dalio. It's on my list. Even if I have not heard of, so I'm going to go onto Amazon, check that out, see what that one's about. The title itself just sounds <laughs> mysterious and interesting compared to like the other two more so so yeah i'm definitely gonna check them out i'm gonna put them in the description as well of the podcast so anyone that's you know listening and wants to check out those feel free to just check out the links below plus also i'll provide links for you know rapid innovation and i'll get any links off you as well jesse that you you know you want to plug in that will help you guys out so i'll put that in there so if you want to see what jesse is up to and his twitter and you know the you know the actual rapid innovation page i'll put all that there so I just want to thank you, you know, thank Jesse one more time, you know, for coming on, taking the time, you know, just over two hours now to talk to me. You know, it's been really ins- insightful and good to speak to someone that's you know in the blockchain space as well, and also is a CEO of a company as well, you know, a fast growing, successful company. So thank you very much. Hey, you're very welcome. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you.